Hello, and welcome to this webinar, All Aboard, Making Equity Central in Transportation Planning. I'm Anita Hairston from PolicyLink, and I'm pleased to be your moderator for today's session. On behalf of my PolicyLink colleagues, I would like to thank you for joining us today. Let me start us off by setting the context for today's webinar. Many of you are joining us because you are one of 143 grantees of the HUD Sustainable Communities Initiative. Others are engaged in local or regional activities to plan the future for your community. In your work, you have likely recognized the important role transportation plays. Transportation is a critical linked opportunity, connecting us to jobs, schools, housing, health care, and grocery stores. However, millions of low-income individuals, people of color, and people with disabilities live in communities where quality transportation options are often unaffordable, unreliable, or non-existent. Over 7.5 million U.S. households have no access to a vehicle, and nearly 20% of African Americans, 14% of Latinos, and 13% of Asian Americans have no access to a car. Nearly two-thirds of all residents in small towns and rural communities have either no access to transit or substandard transit services. Across all metro areas, the typical worker can only reach about 7% of the jobs in the region via a one-way 45-minute transit commute. And workers living in low-income suburban neighborhoods face some of the biggest challenges. They cannot access over three-fourths of low- and middle-skill jobs via transit. And while the federal government has set a goal of having one of every 10 transportation contracting dollars, go to small firms owned by women and people of color, very few states meet this goal. These trends tell us that we must chart a new course for our nation through transportation investments that can ensure that all people can participate and prosper. PolicyLink has been working with equity leaders around the country, many of you on this line today, to develop tools that you can use to address these very challenges. Following this webinar, I encourage you to visit PolicyLink's website to access these resources. Today, we are fortunate to be joined by speakers who are leading the way in reversing the trends I just mentioned. They are making sure that transportation is a bridge to opportunity rather than a barrier. Now I would like to introduce our terrific lineup of speakers. I'll introduce them in the order that they will present. Barbara Stiffarm is the Executive Director of Opportunity Link, an organization which works across the state of Montana. Dr. Beverly Scott is General Manager of the Massachusetts Bay Transportation Authority. Barbara Major is a member and immediate past chair of the New Orleans Regional Transit Authority Board of Commissioners. Sam Pepperman Gelfont is a senior staff attorney at Public Advocates, an organization located in San Francisco. And lastly, Jeff Hobson is the deputy director of Transform, located in Oakland, California. We are fortunate to have these seasoned leaders with us today. They will describe promising practices that they have used to leverage transportation investments to accomplish some very important goals. Enhanced transportation choices, shared economic prosperity for all, expanding access to contracting for firms owned by women and entrepreneurs of color, and community stability in urban neighborhoods, small towns, and rural communities. Before I turn to our first speaker, I want to share two important housekeeping notes for our listeners. Number one, after the webinar, you will each receive an email from PolicyLink containing link to the audio archive of this webinar, plus the slide presentations from each speaker. So don't feel like you need to write down everything you see on the screen. Number two, following all, three, all of our speakers' presentations, 
I will facilitate a discussion among our speakers and participants. Please use the chat feature on your screen to send us your questions. You can submit your questions at any time during the webinar. With that, it is my pleasure to turn the floor over to Barbara Stiffarm from Opportunity Link.
Hello. Hello. Hi, Barb. You can go right ahead. Hi, this is Barbara Stiffer. I'm the Executive Director with Opportunity Link. In the video you just saw is the first of, of a four-part video series that we produced to illustrate the challenges and success of rural transportation in North Central Montana. I'll give you some links later on our website so that you can view all of the other remaining or look at this one again. I hope you um, were able to understand the transportation challenges that our community residents face through the reviewing the video. Opportunity Link is a nonprofit organization. We were established in 2004. It was through a, a regional planning process that was funded by the Northwest Area Foundation. We have a region that is made up of 11 counties and three Indian reservations, the Blackfeet, the Fort Belknap, and the Rocky Boys Indian Reservation. During the planning process, transportation just came out as being one of our key strategies for building prosperity in our remote and rural regions. It was determined that access to transportation was critical to increasing shared economic prosperity and promoting community stability in our small towns and rural communities. With transportation, people in isolated communities are provided the opportunity to gain access to not only basic services, but they can also gain access to health care, employment opportunities, complete their education, and anything else that's required so that they can improve the quality of their life. We have very many hundreds of heartwarming stories, like you saw in the video, that relate to that. Our regional transportation planning process started in 2006 when we realized that there was a duplication going on of everybody doing their own plans and not thinking regionally. We facilitated the development of a regional transportation plan that gave options for each community to, to consider for implementation and for coordinated implementation, sharing amongst each other. The plan identified the needs, the resources, and potential models for implementation. Um, each community was given those, and we were asked to decide, you know, which way would work best for them. Um, Northern Transit Interlocal was established in 2008 as a partnership between two counties and three towns in the western part of our region. We help support that financially. Fort Belknap Transit System of the Fort Belknap Indian Reservation followed in March of 2009. And then North Central Montana Transit started in August of 2009 as a partnership among three cities, two counties, and two tribal governments to serve in between the middle of those other two that were started. We brought together tribal governments and the cities and counties, several community organizations and education organizations to help form that partnership to launch the North Central Montana Transit. We are we were asked to serve as the lead agent for that system and we are continuing to manage it. The Rocky Boys Transit serving the Chippewa Cree Tribe and Rocky Boys Indian Reservation was also established in 2009, and then it was followed by Two County Transit in 2010 and Glacier County Transit in 2012. So the regional concept and partnerships and development of collaborative efforts to meet this need in our region is ongoing. From this process, we learned that it's essential for us to keep our role as a neutral convener. We have to stay as a neutral convener to help facilitate meetings and partnerships whenever needed. We are also able to make sure that everyone is represented. These are open community public meetings that community residents would not normally attend if sponsored by, say, a government entity. Finally, as a convener, we felt it was our role to provide information and technical assistance whenever it was needed to help inform planning and implementation processes. And we learned by example, and we still continue to learn. Since we were not a transportation expert, we sought out the assistance of the Western Transportation Institute of Montana State University. They assisted in the planning and helped us design portions of our service delivery and are always willing to work with us to, to include new partnerships in that service planning 
process. We continue to gather information and share learning experiences to inform policy and to foster sustainability for these valuable public transportation services. We've had a lot of other projects since then, ranging from biodiesel demonstration projects to the HUD Sustainable Communities Planning Project, which fits right in with our transportation planning. We firmly believe that most of these stem from the partnerships and collaborations formed from our regional transportation planning process. It's only the tip of the iceberg. We plan on doing way more. And for more information on these and our other programs, you can visit our website. It's shown on the screen before you, um, or you can contact me at our phone number. The other three videos are available on our website, and you can click on the Regional Projects tab to see all of them. Appreciate being invited to participate in this call today, and look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Barb. And as a reminder to folks, all of you will receive a copy of this presentation. Um, following the webinar. I would now like to turn the floor over to Beverly Scott from the Massachusetts Bay Transportation Authority, who will discuss tools, processes, and metrics that will help to achieve more equitable transportation outcomes. Dr. Scott? Okay. Thank you very much. Um, it's really a pleasure to be able to join, and I'm going to keep my comments just kind of, a, just kind of a, a talking through, but um, just thinking about this whole area of, of, of equity and the choices that we make in transportation, we're going to move it on. And this is um, really to just kind of start out with some reflections, which is that it's, um, it's honestly, it's a very, very complicated um, thing. I've learned, I guess, over 35 years is that it's, it's a very complicated um, discussion in terms of equity. Um, that I, I will say to you that um, my own perception is perspective is that it's not about it's not sameness equity is not sameness and that there is really no cookie cutter um, from how you know from getting from here to there particularly when you're talking about individual communities because every community is different but I will say to you that in terms of so trying to define what equity is and. I think that the um, metropolitan, um, that, that our uh, MAPC up here has really done a pretty good job of, I think, at least trying to lay out, so what is equity and how do we look at it from a regional perspective? And I'm just going to kind of give you the, and I think this is quite important, because um, you'll hear me talk about institutionalization of um, the whole concept of equity. So I'm going to, and what that means to me is, if equity is something that we that is really we really mean it, then it's all the way through every single document, through every single thing from a policy perspective, it is important that the region or the state or the area grapple with what is it that we are really trying to articulate in terms of what does equity mean to us? How will we measure it? How will we know it? Okay. I'm not saying that this one is the end all be all. I think it's one of the better I've seen, but I'm going to it's an equitable region is where all people have full and equal access to opportunities that enable them to attain their full potential. A diverse labor workforce prepared for the region's knowledge economy, healthy residents and low health care costs, and communities where people, and this one to me is very, uh, communities where people of different ages, incomes, races, and ethnicities have real options to live, work, learn, and play side by side. Now, I'm only here for about 10 months now, and but just going through and listening to how, they, how this region got to the point of actually articulating this as part of the whole decision-making process in terms of how we get from here to there came as a result of very difficult, um, very intense, thought-provoking conversations, okay, um, because once you, you you put it down there, it's like, well, how are we going to get there? So just to kind of come back, and I, the reason I put these this little thoughts, we put these bubbles about legacy investments and environment and growth and new investments and sustainable development is some of that part about um, it's not sameness, um, legacy investments. I happen to be working, having the privilege to work in the in an area that has the oldest subway system in 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 uh, the United States, 
So that's a heck of a legacy investment, okay? <laughs> Most of the T system is, okay? And so um, we've got to deal with the fact that it has been here 100 years and that there's a whole lot of growth and everything. It's not the same as having the opportunity to be able to, um, um, to, to start out now, if you will. So that's something that has to be taken into consideration. The environment, I'll tell you that having been in this industry for 35 years, that um, probably up until maybe 15 to 20 years ago, and that was for the more enlightened, if you will, people were not were not actually, in, for the large part, making connections between the transportation investment decisions that we were making or the actions we were taking and the impacts, the associated impacts that it was having in terms of the environment and certainly in the areas of energy. Um, in every area, one has to grapple with the issues of um, growth and expansion. And I will tell you that one of the things that I have found most riveting through, uh, once again, the equity lens, it used to be that you could kind of say things like, oh, yeah, well, you know, you have the, we have a, um, a central city and then we have the outskirts. Well, quite candidly, that whole picture, and I know I'm preaching to the choir, has shifted very dramatically. So that when we talk about things like fair policies and the types of locational decisions that people have made for a whole host of reasons over the last 30 to 35 years, it is a very different spatial pattern than what existed 50, 60, 70 years ago. So when we start talking about things like how we throw costs on fares and stuff, I, I start laughing. I say, you, we better be real clear about what kind of fare policies now need to be in place that are much more complicated than you used to say, okay, it's the inner city and it's the suburban areas and this old stereotypical thinking that it was the affluent people that were in the outlying areas and and uh, more low income and stuff inside the inside the central city. So it's a much more complicated and multinucleated, if you will, pal palette than we had in prior years. Certainly uh, the world of, of uh, new investment and how one prioritizes making those new investments and, of course, the, the, the overall um, in terms of sustainable development. So if we keep, just keep on, we'll go to the next one. Um, just to give you a sense of Boston's population, just and, and the reason I do this is because um, you, we will find this riveting all across the all across the United States is that um, areas have changed tremendously and they continue to change. Okay, in terms of the in, in terms of their uh, overall breakdown. So here I give you one in terms of race and ethnicity. Um, it was shy, it was surprising to me. I had worked in the Rhode Island area back in the mid 90s and. Certainly there had been some change in New England, but nothing near what is now 15 years later. Uh, I come into an area where people right away and claim it with pride. Well, did you know that we are a minor we are one of the minority-majority cities? And no way in my – even coming here, I didn't even think about it. In my last, I said, oh, is that what is – is this really the composition in terms of, of, of Boston? And yes, we are over fifty over fifty percent in terms of of, of uh, ethnic minorities in the uh, in the city. Now, here is the other part of it, though, that causes, um, and this is where you're going to hear me get into another piece, which is so you saw the demographic, um, you saw us from a race and ethnicity standpoint, but the reality, and this has been in many communities that I've lived in, this is much beyond race and ethnicity. Once again, preaching to the choir, but look at the kind. Look at what we've got going on in terms of income here, okay? And so the more and more the complexity in terms of equity is one that definitely must get defined much beyond um, much beyond the issue of uh, race and ethnicity. We are we are very much um, haves and have nots, okay? And some of those um, and, and, and those those um, measures, if you if you will are continuing to grow faster and faster and faster. And so I just left another wonderful community, Atlanta. Some of the, and I'll just put that one in there, Atlanta has uh, some of the, the highest percentages in terms of, you know, uh, uh, ethnic groups of African Americans, most millionaires and all that, but quite candidly suffering very much from just the whole same kind of condition, haves and have not. And so one of the things I want to make a point of here is that the real point is when you're trying to come to consensus within a community on those kinds of issues that are major, transportation, us transit, we got to come to decisions in terms of who pays and fare policies and things of that nature. 
it, being able to wind up bringing all of the richness of all of this together is very, very important in terms of how one does very good uh, community outreach and participation because to me the issue really comes down to how can we wind up defining transportation in ways that kind of cut through all of this. There's what's good in it for you, what's good in it for me, what's good in it for us, and I say coming to the bottom line as to why these investments, if you will, where's the big we in those investments. Um, kind of quickly coming to I, I can never, I don't care what community it is, I think there's just certain fundamental things I always say to folks. You got to follow the decision making and follow the money, and it needs to be very much a, a very much strategic mapping that takes place. There certainly are different layers behind here, but I tell folks all the time, in in my world, just start out, be real clear about it. We have a board of directors. And that board of directors is the one that ultimately approves what the decisions will make, including who sits in the chair that I sit in. And so it's seven members, and this is just what ours looks like, but I'm real clear, appointed by the governor, okay? So, and the members include da-da-da, and then ours happens to be one by that also has, our statute has some areas that speak to uh, portfolios, if you will, but once again, that could have just as easily said things like, "Oh, there will be a rider on it," or "I've been in different, I've been in nine different communities." So, but 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 we can shape these things, okay? And but that's just to give you ultimately this is this is this part of the picture, and then for each area, and every area has one, whether it's an independent authority, whether it's a city structure, whether it's a county structure, just being very clear about where what staff do, where decision makers are, and how in every instance one can in fact wind up impacting, um, having a voice in, in trying to impact that. The next is, I'd say this is one on a um, every single area when it comes to transit funding um, and certainly transportation, understanding the metropolitan planning organizations and what they are, who they are, and how people get appointed to them. I think particularly in the world of transportation, certainly when it comes to federal funding and how it flows, but quite candidly it also has a major impact in terms of your local as well because almost all of these projects, to do them requires both federal as well as local funding. This is a level of what I almost call invisible government because what takes place at these metropolitan planning organizations and particularly because all of our governmental structures are so antiquated. We got cities, we got counties, we got uh, that that most of the things that we want to do go across geographical boundaries. And so the MPOs have become a, a way of being able to have regional decision making around major policy areas that really are not bounded by just a defined geographical area. So basically the the prioritization of regional transportation needs for an area, certainly as it relates to federal funding, all of that takes place at your metropolitan planning organization. And then that metropolitan planning organization and the work that's done at the MPO also winds up prioritizing and ultimately what your funding streams are going to be for those major projects. And so one can be sitting up arguing about, I really want X, Y, Z to happen, but and sitting up at the transit agency talking about it when quite candidly maybe six months before the unified work program for the for the region was uh, determined at the MPO level and now for all practical purposes the transport the transit agency is really implementing at this point. So I cannot say enough um really being clear about um understanding the, the how decisions are made, who sits on these boards, who appoints who sits on these boards and uh, once again, uh, a lot of uh, – and making those be part of when you're making decisions about elections and things of that nature and who to support, uh, being clear about what your agendas are relative to that. Now, in terms of a just the federal transit, and it surely is not just civil rights because you pick it up in the environmental area and whatever, but just being clear about the fact that there is a, regular, a regulatory framework that has some very, um, some very important and strong keys, and it's across – 
several areas, and I simply say once again, tools in the toolkit. Um, certainly in the area of Title VI and environmental justice, some of the best work over the past couple of years that the that this administration has done was to really do an update in the Title VI area. That hadn't been updated in, God knows, probably 25 or 30 years, and really coming out with one in the area of environmental justice. And I say, well, this is really talking about it. When you look at what transit agencies do, it's really about the service we provide, what do we do in terms of facilities, where are we making our, where are we making our infrastructure investments, in, in uh, uh, all, how are we hiring, okay, and then what is it that we're holding our major contractors responsible for. Same thing in terms of disadvantaged business enterprise. The, we're supposed to be reflective of the communities that we serve. In some instances, we are talking about hundreds of millions, and in, this, in, in some of the largest systems, billions and billions of dollars. And if we're going to be reflective of the communities that we serve, that that should be something that is not just talking only about service, but also looking at employment opportunities as well as opportunities for everyone, for historically underutilized businesses, to have an opportunity to be able to, to uh, participate, if you will, in the benefits that wind up coming out from an economic development standpoint, and then, of course, um, the area of, uh, of, 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 accessibility, of overall accessibility with the Americans with Disability Act. And then, um, once again, just, just, you know, it is, it's, it is a complicated palette, but I will say that, um, once again, changing the equation, okay, we do a terrible job in transportation of actually measure of, of, of measurement and quantification. So we do not, we, we are investments, but we do a poor job of, of really what I call the, of, of being able to quantify what the multiplier effect is of transportation investment, which helps to make it more of a we, and that is uh, to be able to really speak to as well as quantify the impacts that we have from an economic development standpoint, community health, the environment, and then, of course, just the whole notion in terms of overall equity. So I think that what we need to do here, and there's been a lot of good work that's been done in this area, but we, we as transportation are not just the it. So we need to stop just talking about mean distance between failure and, and a mean distance between service interruption and all of those things and really turn, the, turn it around and be able to start talking about how many jobs did we create, what was the impact that we had on, affordable, on, on the increase in affordable housing in the area, what do we do to move greenhouse gas emissions? What do we? It's, what have we done to be able to help in terms of a walkability index? What kind of impact did that have in terms of obesity and stuff within new neighborhoods? There are connections, and I'm simply saying once again, there's been a lot of discrete work done in that area. Some tremendous work. I don't think we are anyway starting from scratch. But as and certainly on the national level, as everyone is going to the whole thing in terms of performance. Instead of, instead of being needs-based, performance-based, making sure that we change the numerator and the denominator and get some criteria that are out there that help to prioritize transportation investment and decision-making in a different way is absolutely critical. And I, I certainly don't have all the answers to it, but I think that that is a mantra that we must insist in and play in the game of, of helping to move that, those needles um, at a local level and then at the national level. In terms, and then in terms of equitable access, every we do have people do have power. Okay, I'm saying, and I just cannot stress I just cannot stress this enough. And it does not take a thousand. It would be wonderful to have a thousand people, but it does take um, you know being informed, and it does take um, being persistent and being there. Okay, um, so uh, I can't it, learning how to do civic engagement and civic engagement very very well to have many voices at the table, and that was getting back to some of the pieces in our community. I mean, it is very, very diverse. So when you start having conversations about, you know, issues like fares and who pays and all of that, um, we all need to strive to have more than just the usual suspects at the table, and we need to make these conversations be as much about the we, which is also not just the rider, because most of the time the people who are really paying for the system are much broader than the people who are using the system. But the point is, by being able to move to outcomes, it is all the big we that are benefiting from the from the system and making that, trying to constantly find ways to make that case and make it better are important. So here are some of the things that just uh, to, to wrap up on outcomes in terms of 
um, different dimensions, and we mentioned some other ones of, of uh, trying to help to be able to make the case in a better in a, and I think a fuller way in terms of, of, of why bottom line should we have um, should we support transportation investment and uh, equitable transportation investment because this is what makes this America be America when everybody has a reason to uh, be a part of and, and, and everybody has a way of benefiting. So those are so that's what I had to say quickly as I could and I'm sticking to it. Wait <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Scott. And uh, if my speakers in our audience will indulge, I just want to ask you two quick questions because I am aware that uh, you may not be able to join us for the full hour. Two questions came in. One, how does one find out if Region has a disadvantaged business enterprise program? And number two, if you uh, talk with your metropolitan planning organization and you find that they don't have much power, uh, in decision making, um, what, where would you start? Where would you advise someone to start to influence, uh, uh, exert some influence in the area of equity? Okay, I can tell you that um, for any transit, for your transit system, if they're receiving federal assistance, then they have a provision that they have to have a disadvantaged inter uh, business enterprise program. So what I would say to you is, go on your USDOT website. Okay. You will have a regional. There will be a regional office for wherever you are. I think there are just there are nine regional um, areas in the country. And but go on your U.S. and go on your USDOT website. That will give you the entree into um, what the regional offices are. Um, of course, call your own transit system and ask to speak to the general managers. Of, I'm not for whatever size it is. Just ask to speak to your general manager's office. And they can all, you know, you can start figuring, not knowing what their organizational structure is, but the DOT website will uh, actually, you can do a load down on what the disadvantaged business enterprise provisions are. Um, uh, you can, you'll, you'll find, you can actually get copies. You can always request actually a copy of the DBE plan for your agency through the Federal Transit Administration itself. So, but I would tell you, start with your, uh, start with your transit system, okay? And then the, and then the second question that you have, the second question, I'm actually going to switch up because there's one that's a little bit more specific, and I'm going to take the other question for all the um, okay. panelists. The question for you, Dr. Scott, how can transit fares be more equitably structured, um, especially that, in regions that are, uh, have lots of centers? Do you know what? I, that is what I say, um, equity, and that's where I say it's very complicated, okay? Um, how it can be more equitably structured is in the first instance to wind up being able to honestly have a absolute conversation within one's community about who pays, okay? Because at the end of the day, somebody is going to have to pay and being clear in that community about where those values are about the whole issue of payment is absolutely critical. And you have to wind up having your region deal with the issue of equity and whether or not that that reason that region chooses to because somebody's going to pay so if you if the fares are not if you make the fares too reasonable if, if you make the fares too too low but nobody's prepared to put the rest of the money in it's all about pots and I'll say this very quickly i because you can only make bricks with hay so if you wind up having very low fares, but there was no tolerance to wind up put, being able to put much of anything in terms of the way of an investment into your transit service, then you may wind up winding up with very low fares, but you got pecans for what the, le the quality and the level of the service are that you have. Okay, and so that's why I say that it is a um, it, the the issue of affordability. I can't even tell you fare box recovery because it depends upon what is the amount of ridership you have. Fair box recovery is convenient for some people, but I tell you the honest God's truth, it's nothing for a New York or whatever to have a 50 or 60 percent fair box recovery. Quite candidly, for us in some of our services, we have fair box, high fair box recovery levels, but that's because of the fact that we have so much ridership, okay? If I went to another part of the country, it may very well be that 11 or 12 percent makes perfect sense for them, but it may be because of the fact I always look at the Florida systems. The Florida systems have, have typically had very, have had very reasonable fares, 
One of the reasons they've done it, though, has been as a conscious part of public policy because they have many, many seniors. They have, as a community, as a, as a state, they, they understand that, um, the, the, that having um, independence and mobility and access on the part of that community is very, very important to overall quality of life. And as a result, they have made associated conscious investment decisions that they are going to keep the fares lower, okay? That's their decision, but that decision has come because of a because of a whole complex of them getting there. So if, if that makes any, you know, so so that I does. Think there's no way to do this. This is I'm gonna say this, and I'm just gonna if there's anything I can say, this kind of stuff is not a one-time inoculation, and it is not a spectator sport. When you want to wind up having these kind of principles that are in, because you got to cover it all the way through. You can't just talk about I want a low fare and then not be able to not get out there and hold everybody accountable and make them put the kind of investments into the overall transit system that need to be there. What do you want to have? You want to have equity fare and then you don't wind up having any broader investment that gave you quality service. So this is one of those that it is a you got to mix it up. You got to keep it. You got to keep it on the front burner, and uh, and 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 I and I think you and you keep the journey up. And I think you get. I think you get there, or you know what you do. If you don't get there with the group that's there, then you get rid of them, including people at your transit system. I'm being honest. But you get rid of them, and this is true, and you say, well, look, these are the things that are important to us. We want to have affordable housing. We want to wind up having affordable transit fares. We want to have quality transportation with many options and choices. And we want to put people in office who are going to understand that and are going to to, to be supportive of those of those kind of policy decisions and then the investment decisions to back it up. So I come back and I'm shut up and say, follow the money, follow the decision making, and make sure that you are out there on the front line nicely but persistently, and sometimes with, it can't be too nice, it needs to be constructive agitation, saying what's important, but always with, um, you know, doing it from the heart that it's just, you know, these are some things that are just values that are just the right thing to do. Thank you, Dr. Scott, for your for your candid advice for us. I would now like to turn to Barbara Major from the New Orleans Regional Transit Authority Board of Commissioners, who's going to tell us about implementation of more inclusive policies for contracting and how that's helped to change the decision-making process at that agency. Barbara? Um, hi, and thank everybody for joining. Uh, first of all, I'll, I'll, I'll tell a little story. And that's about me having come to the Board of Commissioners from a community organizing background. And when first asked to serve on the board because uh, you're appointed to the Board of Commissioners in New Orleans, it is a regional board. However, our transit system is not our transit system is not yet regional, and uh, there's a whole history behind that. So coming to the board, like most other people, having spent most of my time on public transit. Uh, growing up, I only thought of transportation as a way to get from point A to point B. Um, coming on the board pre-Katrina and being on the board after Katrina and serving as chair and working with folk in the community, particularly small businesses, because it, there's a, none of this stuff is separate from each other. And uh, But I'll just tell the New Orleans story. It's not separate in terms of when Katrina hit New Orleans. Small businesses were most impacted because they, most of them had used their homes really to start their small businesses. They were also the ones who were saying to me, I could never get work at the Regional Transit Authority, Barbara. I could never look like, okay, so when I look around, you look around, it's like, why aren't they getting work at the Transit Authority, you know? And what I instinctively knew, um, I yet had to prove. So I was doing some other work in community and asked, uh, policy link actually uh, for a grant for fifteen thousand dollars that said I need to be able to demonstrate that that's this, that there is disparity within the regional transit authority of who gets contracts and that translates also into who gets jobs because small businesses hire our folk because we're a, a subdivision and we're not controlled by either the state or the city council. Uh, we do make decisions. We do make the decision on how money 
will be spent um, in New Orleans with the transit authority. And we're relatively small in New Orleans when it comes to the amount of money that we have access to, because when I look at after Katrina, we're now looking at the next 36 months, probably $6 billion is going to be spent in New Orleans. So for us, the issue of equity at this point has become a struggle of economic equity. And so, like they say, you drop your bucket where you are. And for me, that was uh, regional transit authorities. Like, how can we bring about equity in access to contracts? Because when it comes to uh, marginalized communities, a lot of people want to talk about jobs, and I want to talk about jobs. But very seldom do you, talk, do you hear people talking about wealth creation. I wanted to look at sustainable wealth creation in my community and access to livable wage paying jobs in the community. And I had to start where I was, which was regional transit. With that $15,000 that we got as a grant, we commissioned getting the board, because I had to bring the board along. I think it was Dr. Scott. You have to bring people along, wonderful people on the board. Not, it's not always about intentionality that we neglect to think beyond where we are, but it's just that it's, it's just more comfortable. It doesn't cause any ruckus. So bringing the board and myself, because, I mean, being a long-time organizer, you can forget some of the old tactics. So bringing the board along, we did a study, a little initial study, and what that little initial study showed is, oh, wow, you know, we really are really not being fair to small business. I said, okay, now, boards, we get it. They go like, yeah, we get it. So then we, we commissioned a bigger study. You know, we get studied to death, but it's okay. If it's leading us somewhere that we need to get to. The biggest study showed not only were we helping to create disparity, we were doing absolutely nothing to move beyond where we were. We had a DBE office. However, that office was ineffective because there was nobody holding that office accountable. We do certifications for DBE being disadvantaged businesses. So what I had to do was, one, okay, we got to put our money where our mouth is. The board would go like, yeah. So we started a small business office within the regional transit authority. What we learned is that we had missed the opportunity over the last, I think, three years prior of putting at least $14 million in the hands of small business. Once we started that small business office and said, okay, we got the money to do that, we then hired a person who had the consciousness that we had in terms of where we wanted to go. And so that $15,000 study has led to us being able to now put about $18 million in the hands of small business. And that came for us understanding how we can break up big contracts, uh, one of the things that we learned is, okay, how do you – We our small businesses don't have working capital. I met with every president. First I asked, where was the money? As chair of this board, where do we put our money? What bank do we put our money in? They told me what bank we put our money in. I said, okay, I want to see the Community Reinvestment Act portfolio on that particular bank. It did not look good. I met with every president of every local bank in the city, took our money and split it up. Twenty-three million here, twenty-three million left, split it all up. But it depended on their community reinvestment. It depended on how they board look. No women, no people of color. You don't get our money. The board agreed to these policies. These have become policies. The other thing is, okay, our small businesses now need working capital. Okay, banks, come back to the table. Are you willing, if my small business has a contract with RTA, Regional Transit Authority, are you willing to upfront working capital for them based on that contract and we'll create a dual pay plan? So when they get paid, you get paid. We have two financial institutions that are now doing that. We also know that equity and, and transportation is beyond transportation. So we've started to organize now or outside. The RTA is not doing it, but we've moved to organize small businesses outside of the Regional Transit Authority. And the city of New Orleans has just now implemented a disadvantaged business policy with some teeth in it but these are, I mean, I cannot separate the politics and the community organizing from the equity struggle because that's where all struggles are. You know, I mean, there's going to be some organizing in it. So we've just gotten a, a strong disadvantaged business policy. We also know that the fight won't stop here because as soon as we get it, we will get pushed back. We also had to go to the... Uh, the Attorney General's office to get okay to, to break down some of these big projects. Because we know the big boys, the Association of General Contractors, will attack anything you do in our in our area 
that has to do with allowing access for small businesses. So we did get an approval to do that. We've done it. There is yet a lot for us to learn. We still have our small businesses. We are part of the city now as a collective to certify small businesses, uh, working with SBA to try to get them to be really more an advocate and give resources to small business. But we've had to redefine some things like good faith effort. What does that mean when a big company tells no company that we really tried to call you, we couldn't get you on the phone? Well, you know what? That doesn't work here anymore. We have very strong and stringent policies about how um, you reach out to small businesses. And the other thing that we just passed is that we now have a policy where our small businesses will get paid within 15 days because they don't have the cash flow. But we go back to these small businesses, too, and they got to deal with the fact that they got to be fair in terms of hiring people and paying a livable wage. But the struggle, and, I, and I'm also approached by the union. you got all these different arms coming at you. And my struggle with the union right now is, look, we believe in livable wage, but I said to the union leadership, you got to clean up some of the racism within your, within your union structure because our folks, even when they go there, get dealt with it. There is not in New Orleans... And I'll say this, and this is my own organizing, my own understanding. When I'm dealing, whether it's transportation or whatever, there is always the issue of race here in this city. We are not a regional transit authority because historically the parishes, we're not counties, the parishes closest to New Orleans have refused to allow New Orleans buses to come into their parishes. And we knew that it was about race. We've always known it's about race. Dealing with the same thing now, just bring a streetcar two blocks over. It's ridiculous, but it's real. Uh, it, but when you start this battle around equity, it is, it is to me, very connected. It is very much a civil rights issue for, for people of color and marginalized people. Because when it comes to small business, I'm also talking white businesses that are small businesses that are not part of the big boy network here in the city. Uh, it has become very, uh, I've learned a lot, actually. <laughs> Some things I know, like I know that there's going to be pushback all the time, but you an organizer, you know. So what I would say to people is that you do this work by, one, not assuming that everybody that sit on boards or everybody that's out there is, is, an, is your adversary. We have some allies. you got to be particular in terms of identifying who those allies are. But when it comes to bringing the issue of equity around transportation, because where these buses go depends on where or not folk can live in those communities and get to a grocery store. Right now we're dealing with re, uh, remapping how our buses move. Because when I first got back from Katrina, I was questioning with, uh, well, why would you send buses in this particular neighborhood? There are no people there. And I go, like, well, maybe there are no people there because there are no buses there. So we started out putting um, buses in places where there weren't as many people, but it paid off. It's like we tried it, and it said, yeah, now we can go back and show you. It is inevitable that struggling communities will continue to have to prove what they already instinctively know from their history and their relationship to these institutions, including transportation. But we've, like I said, opened up our, our hiring. We've dealt with now having extra money to do a training program where we guarantee these 15 young people jobs and they got union jobs. The relationship that we have with our union is unusual, but that union also understood that those of us on the board understood that after Katrina they were trying to privatize public transportation, and this board said that that was not going to happen. So one is continuously learning, because the whole thing with the bank, that was a tactic I probably learned back in the 70s, but I hadn't even thought about it in years. So it's like bringing back uh, some elder wisdom along with new wisdom because the young people are coming in with the technology, which is wonderful. Sometimes they come in with the technology but not the respect to understand the history and the culture of the city. So that is our responsibility and for me, the city, but that's our responsibility to help them understand that we're on the same team. There will be struggles, but what we are aiming for is the same thing. And that is not only do people have a quality uh, transportation, but that they have uh, quality places to live that are affordable because 
we have transportation there, that they have access to good jobs and they have access to shopping. Because right now in New Orleans, even this long after Katrina, we still have what's called food deserts. And many folk who live in both rural and urban America understand that. So we've got to be able to provide transportation for our community. And for those of us who are on board, uh, we've got to rethink what our responsibility are. And for those of us who are not on boards and out there in the community, we need to, one, engage our boards in a, in a way. And I always start out in a respectful way of engaging you to see if you're willing to go and grow with me. And then it's like, okay, then we've got to impose some, some community-based um, organizing methodology to move things forward, and I think transportation is a really good place to put it, and I think I'm finished. That's my seven minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Barbara. I would now like to turn to Sam from Public Advocates and Jeff from Transform, who will tell us how data communications and organizing have been powerful tools to bend a regional planning process towards more equitable transportation outcomes. Sam, Jeff? Uh, this is Jeff Hobson, and I'm going to uh, go ahead and start here and turn it over to Sam in a few minutes, and then he'll turn it back to me after a little more. So thanks very much, Anita. I uh, appreciate you organizing this webinar. And uh, Great. So uh, the San Francisco Bay Area, many of you um, uh, may have visited, be familiar with it. It's a very vibrant um, region. We've got photos here of a farmer's market next to our uh, Chinatown and downtown Oakland, um, lots of mixed-use neighborhoods, a mature public transit uh, system, and uh, all of these things, things that could have described Boston, as uh, Dr. Scott was talking about earlier. Um, we've also got a great climate uh, that makes walking and biking uh, easier to do. Very diverse uh, region, long been a landing place from, for immigrants from around the world. Uh, Black Panthers uh, started here place that really embraces that uh, diversity, also has top-notch universities and an extensive community college system that really fuels uh, uh, the region's economy. That diversity and educational opportunities have been a great combination uh, made for finance, high-tech, biotech, green tech, you got it all. Uh, so it's a very strong region. Uh, we've also created uh, strong advocacy networks within it. Very long history of progressive work groups uh, working together. Most recently in the transportation and land use field, you've seen things like the Great Communities Collaborative or our Social Equity Caucus uh, uh, or the Bay Area Transportation and Land Use Coalition that our organization used to run. It's also been many sophisticated base building organizations, advocacy uh, organizations with large membership base, the Asian Pacific Environmental Network, uh, progressive labor unions. So seems like uh, really great opportunities um, in the region. Everything's fine. We don't have to worry about equity, right? Well, not quite. Uh, that Some of those elements, particularly the strong market and the mature transit system, also mean we're one of the least affordable places to live in the United States. Uh, Low-income families here spend more of their household budget on housing and transportation than anywhere else in the country. It's not really just a threat of displacement happening here. It's a reality currently underway. Uh, in the last 20 years, Oakland lost a third of their block population. We've got lots of challenges here in the Bay Area, but from an equity perspective, displacement is really that biggest threat. So this is the context that we had in the Bay Area um, as the Bay Area embarked on uh, what was called Plan Bay Area, uh, the region's first sustainable communities strategy. Plan Bay Area was an integrated regional transportation and land use plan. It's like the federally required regional transportation plan that every other region in the country does, but it also integrates a land use map of where and how people will live and work. It's based on California's SB 375, a state law that was passed in 2008. And SB 375 asks each region to develop a plan to reduce greenhouse gases from transportation and also to house all of the region's population, house all of uh, the people who are economic participants in the region. So we're not importing people from other uh, regions. 
In the Bay Area, that process started about four years ago to develop a plan that guides $290 billion in transportation funds through 2040. For those of you doing math at home, that's a little over $10 billion per year. So with that much money on the table, of course, a lot of those advocacy networks I mentioned earlier were jumping into action and coordinated efforts to influence that plan. So today we're going to tell you about the equity-focused efforts to influence Plan Bay Area. I'm not going to go through this timeline in detail. just want to make a couple main points about it. We knew from the start that this would be a long process, that it would be iterative with several rounds of scenarios narrowing to a final plan, and so it was worth it to take early opportunities to shape the agenda. We knew the devil would be in the details of that implementation, and so getting ideas out on the table early was key, even if they weren't taken up. So now I'm going to turn it over to Sam, who's going to tell you more about our joint campaign. Thanks. So in addition to the amount of money on the table, I think that one important context from an equity perspective is that the root causes and government policies that have led to our transportation and climate change crisis are many of the same policies that have led to the problematic equity issues. So subsidizing the highway system, um, the restrictive, racially restrictive covenants and exclusionary zoning, disinvestment from the urban core um, was something that caused both suburban sprawl, traffic, and greenhouse gas issues and also a host of social equity issues about access to opportunity and investment. And those post-war patterns still persist today. And I think that that was one of the main things that got a lot of uh, social equity organizations excited about a regional plan designed to address greenhouse gas emissions. The six wins for social equity was the <coughs> Uh, structure that emerged from a very rich conversation in 2010 among a host of social equity groups around the Bay. Um, more than uh, 30 groups participated of all different sorts, and this was really the uh, central regional equity organizing vehicle over the past three and a half years. I want to highlight four features that I think made this, uh, this effort successful. One is that it self-consciously led with equity. Um, if the goal is to get low-income communities and communities of color participating in these decisions that affect their lives and the region, um, creating a doorway that says equity on it for organizing groups and community members to walk through was extremely um, important. Second, it not just broke down silos among different equity issues, but also um, was a forum where advocates for individual issues came to see all of the issues that they work on as interrelated. So if we want to <coughs> achieve healthy and safe communities, um, achieve public health goals, transit service is critical to that. Affordable housing and where people are able to live is critical to transit service and economic opportunity. Third, it was a collaboration between grassroots organizing uh, groups and uh, policy and legal and every type of advocacy organization. So we all sat down at the table together to develop a coordinated campaign. Um, and fourth, there was a real recognition that local on-the-ground issues and neighborhoods were connected to regional systems and vice versa, and that we needed to be acting at different levels of geography and coordination. Um, there was a huge amount of work that went into building trust, educating each other across issue areas and geographies, <clears throat> and that set up the Six Winds to propose in mid-2011 a community-generated um, alternative scenario to the regional plan that was being developed by our regional agencies. <clears throat> uh, it was branded the equity, environment, and job scenario to try to get at the triple bottom line benefits, um, but leading with equity and uh, the theory being that that would also improve environmental outcomes. And 
Um, we were only able to propose this because of the strong groundwork that had been laid working together early in the process across a range of communities. Um, <clears throat> that said, uh, we did not say equity, environment, and job scenario and have the regional agencies immediately say, yes, we'll do that. Um, in fact, it took an incredible amount of uh, organizing from turnout to meetings, which you see here, to meeting with elected officials and agency staff to even get the conversation focused on these equity issues. And it would take another year for us to get the regional agencies to agree to study this scenario. Uh, some core components um, of this equity, environment, and jobs vision include uh, making sure that we're planning for affordable housing both in the urban core but also in suburban job centers that have traditionally excluded low-income people and people of color, protecting low-income communities near transit in the urban core from displacement as development happens, emphasizing an increase in local transit service, primarily bus service, to meet the needs of people who do not have access to cars, and making sure that we're spending scarce resources in the places that are going to pay off the most. Um, as I say, in the summer of 2012, after a year of advocacy, um, we succeeded in getting the regional agencies to agree to study this equity, environment, and job scenario. And jumping forward to um, earlier this year when the environmental review of a range of alternatives was released, the agencies themselves declared the EEJ scenario to be the environmentally superior alternative. So this really vindicated with data the vision that we started off with, which is that leading with equity is really the best way to accomplish a triple bottom line and benefit everyone. We knew that we were not going to win on data alone, however, so there was a intensive uh, campaign uh, uh, culmination um, this year that included an education and advocacy day organized by a couple of grassroots groups, ACE and Genesis, um, who were Core Six Winds partners that fanned out to all nine counties in the Bay Area and uh, 40 elected officials. There was a media and communication strategy that was helped by having um, EEJ as a rallying point to focus the conversation, and there was massive turnout and testimony at a number of public meetings. It was also an opportunity to build support among traditional environmental and business groups for some of the core components of this equity vision. So where did this get us? Um, I would love to say that um, all of this advocacy and data led to EEJ being adopted, but that is not what happened. Um, the, as Jeff said, we knew from the start we were not going to win everything in one fell swoop. Um, however, we did really change the course of the debate. Um, we won key amendments uh, to the regional plan that set up critical future conversations about funding local transit operations, about funding affordable housing, about preventing displacement, and about making sure quality jobs come from this plan. And we also showed a progressive uh, front in the face of really violent um, right-wing advocacy that was just against regional planning altogether. I'm just going to highlight one piece that I think is innovative and replicable nationally of the wins around affordable housing and displacement, and that's the One Bay Area Grant Program. This is the use of uh, local transportation infrastructure money as a carrot to get local governments to adopt equitable and sustainable local housing and neighborhood stabilization policies. Um, this came in in 2012. We've already seen more than a dozen jurisdictions that were had no state-mandated affordable housing plan in place adopt a, such a plan, and one of the conversations we're excited to have is how to strengthen and deepen that program of incentivizing local land use policies as we move forward. And now I'll turn it back to Jeff. Thanks very much, Sam. Uh, so uh, we had a similar mix of success on uh, – and sorry, it took me a moment to switch slides there. We had a similar mix of success and things that needed improvement 
on the transit and major projects uh, portions of uh, the EEJ scenario that we were uh, trying to get past. So I want to make uh, just three points um, from this. Uh, the first is that the final plan that was passed did put more funding into running the existing system than any previous uh, regional transportation plan had done. That's important because it's our lowest income families who depend the most uh, on those systems. But we can definitely do more, and we want a commitment to start a regional transit operations and maintenance program to plan how much transit the region really needs, uh, both to be able to meet our greenhouse gas reduction goals uh, and to promote equity. So the second point uh, was that the focus on performance in the plan as a whole was really key. As a result of the project performance assessment, a really wonky process, um, uh, kind of halfway through the whole planning process, we got a little over two dozen major projects either completely tossed out of the plan or significantly changed. Um, and this was a place where we really saw the value of combining those strong technical skills on policy analysis with a strong organizing push for equity. And finally, a piece that was controversial uh, within progressive circles was the work on high occupancy toll lanes or hot lanes. Uh, this is where agencies let solo drivers buy their way into a carpool lane. Now, obviously, uh, from an equity perspective, the big question there is if you're gathering billions of dollars from drivers, who pays and how do you use those revenues? And so Transform in this process said we only want to see those hot lanes if they provide revenue for transit along the same corridor uh, and don't build new highway lanes with that revenue. And we want to make sure that there's an equity program so they don't just become Lexus lanes. So we had, there's a place where there was definitely a lot of need for improvement. We had some success, but it was mostly about shaping the future agendas. We think that's really important because as many of you have probably seen, transportation agencies are increasingly turning to road pricing. And we need to know how to handle it better. Uh, in questions, if there are folks who have uh, experiences to share, I'd love to hear about those. So what did we learn from these past four years? Some of these lessons uh, up on this slide should look pretty familiar. Start early, be strong, lead with equity, build partnerships with a wide range of allies, do performance-based planning, but you can't depend on just good data. You also need the most vital part of an equity agenda, the power uh, from regional organizing. There are two plus places uh, in these lessons that I want to go a little deeper. Uh, so one is how to balance the lead with equity with the wide range of allies. Um, with equity groups doing uh, their own organizing uh, during the process groups, uh, during the whole planning process, that meant that uh, it was very good for being able to pursue an equity agenda and bringing more people to the table. But it also meant that the progressive groups as a whole, including environmental, labor, and uh, uh, other organizations, it wasn't one monolithic progressive uh, agenda. Uh, and so that meant that there was a lot of uh, coordinating to do. You have to strike that balance, uh, and it can be difficult. The second place I want to go a little deeper is looking at how the having an integrated transportation and land use planning is good, not just because it's a good planning approach, but it also is good because it provides more avenues to make the equity arguments. And you can use this, too, all of you around uh, the country, even if you're not in California and don't have the requirements of SB 375. For all of you regions out there who are sustainable communities grantees, that funding came from a joint HUD, DOT, EPA effort to get more integrated transportation and land use planning to achieve equity, environmental, and economic goals. So you've got partners out there. You can work together. And with that, I'll pass it back to Anita in Washington. Thank you, Jeff. And now we're going to take your uh, questions. So thank you all uh, for all the questions that you have passed in. Um, and we're going to start with this question around identifying the source of um, or the, the entity that's got the um, influence and decision-making power over transportation in your community. How do you identify that? If it's not 
the Metropolitan Planning Organization, for example? How do you go about identifying that? And are you directing the question? I'm sorry, I didn't catch. To sure, I, I, I would open that up to any of our any of our speakers because it feels like uh, all of you may have some experience around that. Well, I think that what Dr. Scott said about following the money is a really good point. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, the people who make the billions of dollar decisions about how transportation funding or how uh, uh, housing funding is going to be distributed. Um, that's where uh, the most power uh, is going to be. You may have to follow back um, to see whether the what appears to be the place where the decision is made um, is really it or whether that's mostly shaped by decisions that come prior to it. Uh, but I think following the money is a very good place to start. Thanks, Jeff. Um, our next question, and I'm hoping uh, Barb Stefarm may be able to speak to this question. Uh, the the um, questioner is saying that often um, goods and services aren't always distributed in an equitable manner because sometimes those who are marginalized aren't included in the development of them. What are some ways that um, you can engage um, some marginalized uh, populations? Well, I guess the greatest example that I have of that is in in our planning discussions. Um, we talked about educational institutions partnering with us, and <clears throat> there we're in a desire to recruit students, and we had larger populations outside of where they normally got their students from that um, were, were able to gain access to our partnership. So in, in thinking of... Um, how to what really came down to was we went out to those areas those communities and asked the people you know where where do you need to go and and what are some areas that are what are some things that are creating the barriers and so that's how transportation actually got identified to begin with and then to go back out and talk to those individuals and say you know what are some of the um, services or the access? You know, is it is it just the health care or is it you know employment and education, um, even recreation? You know, we were able to gain new partnerships by identifying some of the recreational activities that um, individuals were were not able to participate in, such as um, uh, having. Uh, the walk paths or the, um, you know, we think of rural communities as not needing that type of service, but when we're dealing with weather conditions or mosquitoes or those other types, having an indoor um, area where they can comfortably go in the winter months and walk their required walk um, was something that helped their health. So in identifying all of those and just trying to bring to the top those that are um, can be developed or are addressed in your plan and what partners are needed in order to bring um, resources to help improve that. If, once they start realizing what the barriers are to get there, then, then hopefully they become partners in the transportation. Thanks, Barb. I think that's a great example. Uh, anyone else want to uh, speak to that? before we move on to the next question. Okay. Our, another question is pretty specific, actually, to um, New Orleans. So, uh, Barbara Major, this is for you. Um, can you say a little bit about um, the impact of the Americans with Disabilities Act and Title VI um, as it relates to some of the communities where you were indicating where transit wasn't uh, going? Um, one of the things with, with Title VI, uh, it gives us some strong teeth uh, for the argument of what we can do in terms of the, the in terms of equity. But in terms of um, citizens with disabilities, that was we decided the state. I live in a state, first of all, that cut tremendously. I don't know how many folks know Louisiana, but we are we are the weird ones. I'll just say that. 
So it totally cut um, the program for paratransit. We felt as this authority that, and we can't do it for everybody. I think that's what Scott said, that nothing is free, including freedom. So we had, but we had a moral obligation that we still had to provide transportation for folk who needed it uh, with the paratransit system. So we, we went in our budget. I mean, we don't have the money like anybody else, so we make it work, though. We went in the budget, found some money, and increased our paratransit. We also know uh, got, um along with the city, we work with the city because we, first of all, don't accept all this as our responsibility. When our folk are not receiving the services that they should, whether it's transportation or health care or whatever, that is not just that particular entity's struggle. So we understood that this struggle was both uh, a city struggle, it was a state struggle. So us along with the city, um, have, we have folk who will lobby for us in Baton Rouge around certain services, so now we're looking at probably being reimbursed for the paratransit. But uh, Title VI, yeah, where our transportation was not going was basically it's like it always is. It's You know, we are tourists, a tourism city. That's our number one industry. And so for me, I mean, I, I, relationships is everything. So people see, you know, like a lot of streetcars. The streetcars are wonderful. We love for people to ride them there. You know, I'm, like I said, it's a learning process. I learned this whole thing about headway. Headway is how far between one bus and another bus. And I'm looking at myself saying, well, the streetcar is not that far apart. A lot of buses on Broad Street that far apart. So now we're doing, um, going back out to the community because we've gotten some input. I go out to the community meeting, not just me, other board members as well. We've got some um, input. Now we're going back out with a new um, new mapping uh, for our transportation. Because people, one, come to our board meetings and say, this is what's happening in my community, and two, because we continuously go to the community. So that will probably be, well, no, it will be done by January because, one, Title VI mandates it, but this board also mandates that we go back to the community. I don't know. I hope that answered. That's so that, good. I hope so, too. I, I think it did. Thank you, Barbara. Um, there were a lot of questions about data, and I'll roll them up into uh, kind of one question, um, especially given how much the needs and demographics um, change in communities. What are your um, go-to sources to get data, particularly um, data that helps to point towards equity outcomes, um, and what would you wish was out there and available in terms of data for you to use to um, help get transportation um, choices out to communities in a quicker fashion? This is to all the panelists. It's very beautiful, but very, very, I very go remote. First. Very few people in the area. <laughs> Daily, we we being North Central Montana so Transit. So, so again, the uh, question is, area, what what data is your go-to source, and what is, data uh, would you love to have? Rural or frontier Montana or rural data. frontier communities have different okay, well, challenges and different is, needs. Major, yeah. The main challenge uh, I think that we face here for my data is distance, and it's because we have very low entities. population I, density that transportation is even more important. We need we to keep schools open. We need to keep hospitals open in the rural areas. We need to create jobs. Well, how do you do that? So you need me, transportation. We'll go to transportation here is a huge one challenge. Use a more if you don't have transportation, you don't have access to the basic data, necessities of life. You can't buy food, medical care, you can't go to school. It's just an essential part of life. Why shouldn't we have a community to do it? that is available? I think the data Why that, shouldn't and we and have we access to those here, services really that are would like readily available data in a larger metropolitan uh, area? Look forward in terms of what impact could have. You know, like I know that if, if we just did um, 30% DBE participation, I could put one point in six billion dollars in the hands of small businesses. I would love to have data to show how many houses we would have. 
This is what the it means in terms of, of the number of jobs. We could see that it's like forecasting data, I guess. By the second guess. week, we were scrambling and we don't trying to find a large enough like passenger bus forecasting so that we could make one of our runs of because what, we had 20 some people like standing at the bus stop on a daily direction. basis. And thank goodness they didn't Thanks, lose faith Barbara. in us. And they, Barb, you know, Sam or Jeff? started thinking this could I be a good thing. Sam, I have we never two thoughts. That one, take off like um, I would you recommend for advocates trying to find an academic in the field that is People to help with these to, questions. Uh, make because it's very region to region and issue and by issue. Elderly. Some um, of them are not able to drive or get someone to help them get to another community. The second is that under On our very first day, August 24, 2009, I was getting ready for the event that we were going to have to launch the transit. And I received a phone call from a lady who said, that she was from out uh, in the far reaches of Fort Belknap, uh, and she was and crying origin, because um, she had needed dental work, and the dental end, surgeon um, that she needed to go to was in Great Falls, and, so that and she said that she needed it for several years, and she could find a connection issues. from Fort Belknap to have her, but that she had a terrible at, time uh, being a able to afford a connection from Haver on into Great One Falls. Is that, um, and it was hard to understand her because she said that her mouth was in such bad shape. She'd been so sick. But she was able to, to go have dental work because of the transit. An There's many the stories like uh, that. that. To have this define. type of service available uh, to us uh, raises our standard that, of living. You have um, to Watch and out for what Bob, we were able to make Barbara more was just saying about whether how other communities and people. To try and it's been a good thing. You have local and tribal and so governments at the table. You have economic kind of development organizations at the table. The you have poverty reduction groups at the table. You have the university system uh, at the table. You have uh, and physicians and hospitals at the table. And so, in a very real way, it does take a village to make these type of things happen. They don't just happen overnight. What North Central Montana Transit has done an excellent job at Thank you, and I'll just add um, that uh, one of our uh, webinar participants suggested the American Community Survey as a, as a place for data, and then certainly um, those are the kinds of things where you, when you have that partnership with a university, uh, uh, don't bankroll themselves. They are often and so that kind of data. We, we um, need so, forward thinking, policy link has uh, been in policy partnerships with the, the uh, tier one institute of the Ohio State University, University and um, the in program on environmental and regional equity at the University of Southern California. And those have been really valuable uh, partners as we in move a lot of the data, particularly I would hope around our sustainable make the right decision. And, invest and with that, we and are at the top of the hour. Areas. I just want to thank you all what so much um, for participating in this things. webinar, and I want to thank Barb, Barbara, Beverly, Sam, and if Jeff for being our speakers uh, today. You provide some wonderful, wonderful sure insights. A reminder, everyone will receive a copy of the comment. slide deck from today's webinar, to uh, as well as the, uh, a link to the audio. And I would ask all vibrant. our participants to please complete if the very brief we post-webinar survey, that, which will appear on your screen momentarily. Thank you again, and have a great day. A lot of futures. Thank you. It's amazing that one thing as simple Thank as you again, a and have a great day. can change a person's life. Thank you. Thank you again, and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you again and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you again and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you again and
It's very beautiful, but very, very, very remote. Very few people inhabit the area. Daily, we, we being North Central Montana Transit, uh, travel an area about the size of the state of Maryland. The size of it is uh, immense. Rural or frontier Montana or rural frontier communities have different challenges and different needs. The main challenge I think that we face here is distance. And it's because we have very low population density that transportation is even more important. We need to keep schools open. We need to keep hospitals open in our rural areas. We need to create jobs. Well, how do you do that? You need transportation. Transportation here is a huge challenge. If you don't have transportation, you don't have access to the basic necessities of life. You can't buy food, medical care. You can't go to school. It's just an essential part of life. Why shouldn't we have a community that is livable? Why shouldn't we have access to those services that are readily available in the larger metropolitan areas? The North Central Montana Transit System was launched in August of 2009. It was predicted that the bus line would see a couple hundred riders each month, but in the 200 days the line has been in operation, they've seen over 13,000 riders. You know, even the sizes of the bus that we ordered originally, 17 passenger. The first day of operation, we exceeded that. By the second week, we were scrambling trying to find a large enough passenger bus so that we could make one of our runs because we had 20-some people standing at the bus stop on a daily basis. And thank goodness they didn't lose faith in us and they, you know, started thinking this could be a good thing. We never thought that it would take off like it did. North Central Montana Transit System has been wildly successful. People are able to uh, make their medical appointments and elderly, some of them are not able to drive or get someone to help them get to another community. On our very first day, August 24, 2009, I was getting ready for the event that we were going to have to launch the transit and I received a phone call from a lady who said that she was from out in the far reaches of Fort Belknap and she was crying because she had needed dental work and the dental surgeon that she needed to go to was in Great Falls. And she said that she would needed it for several years and she could find a connection from Fort Belknap to Haver, but that she had a terrible time being able to afford a connection from Haver on into Great Falls. And it was hard to understand her because she said that her mouth was in such bad shape, she'd been so sick. But she was able to go have dental work because of the transit. There's many stories like that. To have this type of service available to us uh, raises our standard of living. Um, and you're able to make more connections with other communities and people. It's been a good thing. You have local and tribal governments at the table. You have economic development organizations at the table. You have poverty reduction groups at the table. You have the university system at the table. You have um, physicians and the hospital at the table. And so um, in a very real way, it does take a village to make these type of things happen. They don't just happen overnight. What North Central Montana Transit has done an excellent job at is bringing everybody to the table. Without those partnerships, this wouldn't be the success that it has been. This matters. It makes a difference in the lives of people who live in a place that oftentimes has been left out of the national economic scene. Transit systems, particularly in rural areas throughout this country, um, don't bankroll themselves. And so we, we need forward-thinking, progressive, policymakers at both the state and federal level to understand that investing in public transit systems in rural areas is truly an investment versus a cost or an expense and that as we move forward I would hope that those policymakers would make the right decision and invest wisely in public transit for rural areas. What futures can we impact with NCMT? If we focus on growing our communities, growing those assets, making sure that barriers that people encounter in order to improve their lives or to make their lives more vibrant, if we focus on that, then 
we're bound to improve a lot of futures. It's amazing that one thing as simple as a ride can change a person's life.